host, Keenan Nisley, with Team K Squared of Keller Williams. And we are here with The Life of the Land is in Its Real Estate with Think Tech Hawaii. Today's guest, I am so excited to have him, is Lane Kao Oka with simplepassivecashflow.com. Lane, go ahead and tell us about yourself. Uh, I'm amazed at what you've been able to do. Yeah, so kind of my tagline is uh, currently owner of 3,500 units, uh, apartment units and mobile home park units. I uh, syndicate real estate opportunities, and I also coach and mentor a private investor uh, network called the Hui Deal Pipeline Club. Um, but uh, I used to be an engineer, but I left that life behind um, to kind of do this real estate full time. So great. So tell us a little bit about your past. You, you were an engineer and how long have you not been being an engineer? Has that been recent or? Yeah, so I, I graduated college back in 2007 and I um, was an engineer up until about a year ago is when I kind of finally fired the boss. And yeah. Quit there. yeah. So I know that was, that was super exciting. So I met Lane when he was still working. Um, which, which totally brings us into now, explain what maybe syndications are and, and how can folks, how did you get 3,500 doors and, and what do we really mean by that? Yeah, so I initially invested in um, things called turnkey rentals and um, I bought my first one in 2009 and then I got up to 11 of them in 2015. And then I realized owning single family homes or even small duplexes just really aren't scalable, especially for our accredited investors. And I started to join different masterminds and higher level investor groups. And I realized what all the cool kids were doing were going into private placements and syndications. And what those are, um, think of it as like, I use an analogy like an airplane. You know, the airplane has the cockpit with, in there you have the general partners. These guys will find and source the deal, operate the deal, find the lenders, put the lending in their name, so it never goes into the investors' names. And then limited partners or LPs or passive investors will come and coach. They'll uh, pay to get on the airplane and they'll sit down and they'll be quiet and they will hopefully cash the checks. And uh, everybody's sort of aligned in owning this um, a piece of property and it can be a hundred or 300 unit apartment complex. It can be um, a commercial property. It's just a, basically a mechanism for pulling together capital under securities laws. So you started off as just kind of sitting on the airplane and then you, you grew from there or, or where, what is your capacity right now? Yeah, I mean, I initially started to just kind of be a LP, a passive investor, right? So you kind of understand you know how it all works but um then i stepped into the general partner role right now i'm a general partner and probably most of the deals i'm in probably about 12 to 20 deals i'd say i'm a general partner and um kind of running the deal um but you know we we pick, play the role as asset managers so we are not we also employ third-party property managers to do the day-to-day -day, uh, management all right. So are your doors here on, on in Hawaii, are they on Oahu or, or where are you investing? Yeah. So I, I go off the whole saying, live where you want, which is here, right? Like I grew up here in Hawaii, but uh, invest where the numbers make sense. So my philosophy on investing is invest for cash flow. So the property needs to be at least 1% rent to value ratio or higher. Um, you can figure out what the rent to value ratio is by taking the monthly rent divided by the purchase price. And, you know, so for example, a hundred thousand dollar house, um, stuff I would typically buy when I was getting started that rents for a thousand dollars, a thousand divided by a hundred thousand, that's 1%. And you know, if you're above the 1% rent to value ratio, you're, you're pretty much in good shape to be able to cash flow. So we'll typically buy class B and C housing in secondary and tertiary markets um, across the country. We'll see in the South and Southeast where the rent to value ratio and then the population growth is going on. So when you say B and C, what, what does that mean? What? Do yeah. Say? So, so yeah. there's different grades and it's, there's not really any rule, right? There's A, B, C, and D, which is kind of called war zone type of properties. 
for the most part, A class is designated by, you know, year built. So stuff newer than 1995, 2000 is kind of considered class A. You know, a lot of the cool um, yuppie type of places, we call that A plus. But, you know, we stay away from A class because it do typically doesn't cash flow. Um, where we stick around are more B and C class assets. So, you know, B class are more a oh, mixture of white collar, blue collar mix. You know, these are the rents between 900 to $1,200 per month. And then the class C is traditionally um, predominantly uh, blue collar workers in your 500 to 800, $900 range. And um, that might kind of gone over everybody's head, but the way I simplify it, because, you know, I'm trying to, you know, simple passive cash flow is all about making it simple for everybody. If, you know, A class, you know, you and I could probably go running around at nighttime, right? It's just, you know, it's, it's a nice place to be. B class, um, you know, maybe you, you wouldn't want to do that, Kina. <laughs> I mean, it's, but it, it's cool if you and I were walking around during the daytime, right? C class, yeah, let's get our pictures and get the heck inside the, the car even during the daytime we don't want to be out there anywhere after past dawn <laughs> so. and then you know d class which is a war zone or f class yeah we don't want any anything to deal with so uh, the whole idea is we try and stay in the sweet spot of between good c class properties and b class properties because that's where most of america lives yeah. you know that's where the glut of the population is and um you know we, we want the best rent to value ratios but we also don't want to um, deal with a lot of headaches you know i've got a lot of class c properties and they can be hard for collections right even though that the value add is so much stronger there so so now that you brought up collections we do know we're we're headed into the third month of uh, people in unemployment Unemployment rates are sky high. People aren't working. We don't know what we're doing. How how are rental collections going for you? I know yeah, that's so a question. I'm, I'm probably across maybe about a dozen states, different markets. Um, but for the most part, collections are pretty strong. Um, normally, we average about 97% collections. You know, you're always going to have about 3% of the people pay, pay late. But I would say April, we were around, I'd say around like 95, 96%. And then May, it came down a little bit to like 93, 94%. But still, I mean, as long as in a lot of these buildings, the crossover point, the break even point is around 50 to 65% occupancy and collections. So, I mean, this is exactly why, like, you invest in Class B and C assets where you cash flow, right? Because in times of a pandemic, for all things, yeah. you know, people still need a place to stay. So yeah. So, so wow, that that is great. So now you're talking about you're across different states. So what what are the best states? What what states would you recommend if people wanted to do this that they invest in? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, I recommend um, investing in red states, um, not to get political or anything like that, but I want to be investing in where there's good landlord tenant um, laws for me. Um, a lot of blue states, they're in this position where you just can't evict people for almost a year. It's, it's I mean, again, I'm not getting political, but the way I grew up is if you don't pay, you can't stay. Right. And a lot of these places like Georgia, Alabama, you know, you don't pay for 30 days, your sheriff is going to come and kick you out. Right. Not the greatest if you're the tenant, but as the landlord, that's the position you want to be. So, you know, states like Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, you know, places in the South, Southeast is where we like to invest to be on the right side of the, you know, the political spectrum there. Um, and then, you know, the, the two biggest drivers that we look for when we're evaluating a new market is population growth and job growth. So we want to see a nice mixture of different economies, different employers. And then we also want to see the population being going up. And, you know, a lot of that you can find at City Data or, you know, just Google, right? Yeah. You, know, you just say well, population growth or population trends in Huntsville, for example, right? That, I think at, at the high level, that's that's the way that you want to be investing and then kind of dig in and build your relationships with boots on the ground. 
So yeah, so about the boots on the ground, you, you do live here in Hawaii, and uh, how, how are you doing this in different states? Are you flying to these states every other week to look at properties, to check on properties, or, or how are you doing that when you live here in Hawaii? Yeah, I mean, when I was initially doing this, I was living in Seattle and investing remotely. Um, so I have properties in Birmingham, Atlanta, Indianapolis by myself. And, um, you know, I had property managers in those positions. Um, and no offense, Kina, but, you know, I don't trust brokers, right? Like my boots on the ground, the people that I actually hang my hat on for true advice is the property manager. That's the key person on my team because at the end of the day, um, that's the person that's going to inherit my problem. So I want to bring them on board, first of all, because once the transaction is completed, the broker's long gone. Yeah, yeah. I might do another transaction with them, but you know, it's that PM that's going to inherit that tenant and that prop, that property. And then, you know, we don't want to buy that bad property on the blog. No. Um, yeah. So, so how are you even finding these properties? If somebody wanted to do this, how would they even start? How would they even find the, the class B or class C building to start with? Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of the, the commercial properties we buy, I mean, normally the way it works is you don't get access to good deals. I mean, you can, there's a whole bunch of properties you can get on LoopNet, but you know, they're all garbage deals, right? They're all kind of sucker deals. You're not going to get a deal unless you've closed another hundred, 200 unit apartment for. Um, so for folks listening, the, well, the way to start is kind of the build a foothold with some single family home rentals, some residential properties first, build a track record, and then kind of build your team that way. And the way I've done it is, you know, you, this is where your network is your net worth. And kind of in my group, you know, we have a bunch of passive investors. We kind of help each other out with referrals to that first key member, which is that property manager and then brokers. And then, you know, if they're looking for turnkey rentals, you know, we can kind of hook them up with folks that do that stuff too. So you were able to do this while you, while you were working. So do you recommend that, that people get started in this while they're still trying to do that, that nine to five job? Um, is that something people can do? I mean, my, my brand of investing is passive investing, right? And to me, to invest, you need money. You know, if, if you don't have money, you have, you have a money problem. And I can't really help out with that because my, my brand of investing is going after stabilized deals where you need a 20% down payment. So you're going to need that, that initial capital to get started. So if you need to create, if you need that down payment, then the best way to doing that is a, a day job. Right. Most of my clients are doctors, lawyers, engineers, accountants, et cetera. And they realize that their highest and best use is unfortunately, whether they like it or not, is to go to their day job and make a lot of money there to them. But they're going to be smart. They're going to pour it into real estate so that they can become a real estate professional for taxes, you know, possibly offset active income with passive losses, get bonus depreciation and play all these games that the wealthy do. So what if someone only has a small amount of money? Where, where would they start? Say um, I have $20,000. Can I do this with $20,000? Yeah, so $20,000 is probably the smallest amount of money you need to start playing. Um, but ideally, you want to kind of look for a remote rental property. And a lot of good rental properties out there are in the $100,000 range. So $20,000 is right on the ball for that 20% down payment. So that's, that would be the way I would recommend going. Um, of course, you, you probably need a few thousand dollars, at least $5,000 for cash reserves, just in case something, you know, your, your first tenant doesn't work out or something just happens to break. But, um, you know, $20,000, $25,000 and, you know, you should get going to be a passive investor. If not, you're always going to be active, right? Like I see too many house flippers. They just flip houses all day long. And I love, I love house flippers because, like, they pay all my taxes for me. You're welcome. Like, yeah, <laughs> you're, thank you. I mean, last year my eight, my effective tax rate was four percent. Like I, I barely didn't pay any taxes because all my properties we do cost segregations and we draw out as much bonus depreciation as we can. Okay, so can you go back and explain that again? Because I think there will be people that will love to only pay four percent in taxes. So how do you use cost segregation? 
Yeah, so when you own a rental property, as you know, you're depreciating the asset, right? Over typically over 27 years, unless you do what's called a cost segregation study. And we usually purchase one for about $10,000 for, um, a, you know, engineer to go in here and give us this big itemized, big stack of accounting documents, basically. But what that allows us to do is designate what's the three, five, seven year um, amortized or what's the depreciable assets. And right now with the, the tax laws that changed in 2008, we're able to depreciate a huge portion of the building, almost, almost sometimes like one third of the entire building. So we're able to greatly accelerate the depreciation schedule, but you can only do this when you cost segregate your property. So for properties that are under $2 million, it really isn't, doesn't make sense. You know, we live in Hawaii, it's Poho, right? So, but when you're working on a hundred, 200, 300 unit building apartment, it totally makes sense. A 10 grand is a drop in the bucket. And now all investors can partake in that bonus depreciation because they're all, you know, equal equity investors, not debt investors, equity investors, which means they get equal amount of the upside and they get the equal share of the depreciation of the asset. So about how many, say you, you just, you, you told me earlier that you just got a, a 407 door building. Is that correct? What yeah, 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 our last, last one was 47. So how many investors are in on those, those 407 doors? That, that one, we just went over the century mark. <laughs> I was kind of surprised. So what is but that? Yeah, mo most, a uh, hundred investors, hundred oh, LPs. Wow. Yeah. But yeah. so, so they, but everybody makes the same amount of equity. There's a hundred investors and they're all making the same amount of equity. Per, they per their investment amount. You know, most okay. times investors will put in the minimum, which is around fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. And on, I think on this one, the total capital raise was about $8 million. So, you know, if you invested eight hundred thousand dollars you would get ten percent of the whole thing so is that paid out monthly are they getting the yearly check or how how do they see their uh return on that quarterly checks um but mostly because like you know to do it on a monthly basis just too much admin costs right i mean we're we're, we're not a wall street company right we don't have layers and layers of admin and all this fluff you know we want to try and save cost cut costs. And uh, quite frankly, I, I go crazy if I had to do reconcile that stuff every single month. Yeah. So, uh, and, and most, most of our investors, they're not needing the money to live off of. Right. Yeah. I mean, people, sometimes newer investors say, well, I need the cash flow every month. I'm like, well, this isn't for you, right? This is more for higher net worth investors looking to go passive. So, and this isn't just people are just handing you your money willy nilly. You have been vetted. What are, what are some of the stuff you've had to go through to be legal? Because I know when you start getting that many investors, there's there's certain things you have to go through. Right, right. Like, so as long, as soon as you start to take in passive investors money where they are not a controlling entity or they are investing as an LP role, you know, you have triggered securities law. So what I need to do is I need to re basically register, like kind of like I was creating like a stock. In a way, it is sort of like a stock. But I operate under a regulation 506B. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, in, in the big code of all the SEC documents, but I can bring in, um, you know, investors. But, and then everybody has to sign a big thing called a private placement memorandum, a PPM for short, which is a pretty thick page of documents, but you know, it, it does two things. It protects passive investors, you know, that everybody, you know, the general partners have fiduciary responsibility to operate the deal, you know, without foul play and in their best, their best, you know, trying their best. Right. And it also protects general partners because sometimes passive investors can get, um, they can be a pain. Right. And if they don't get what they wanted, they can sue. So it kind of sets the terms pretty neutrally. So everybody's on the same page. And, um, you know, that, and that, that's kind of why when we bring in investors into our group, you know, it's a relationship thing, right? We're, people are interviewing us just like we are interviewing them, right? So, so yeah, so there's always a risk with investing. 
um, that's what investing is. But but yeah. So what if someone wanted to invest with you? What would they What would they need to do? Yeah, I mean, the big thing is you know get get to know us, right? You know, we, I live here in Hawaii, so I'm pretty accessible. Um, but you know, the way I've kind of gone about. I don't really need to do this for money anymore. So it's more about meeting cool, interesting people um, along the way. And, you know, investing with cool people, right? Because some, let's be frank, like some people can be jerks. I don't want to do business with those type of people, right? Life's too short. Yeah. So it is. That's that's part of the reason I do this job is the people that, that you meet. That's the best part of it. So you do offer some education for, for people who'd like to get started. You want to share a little bit about that, how they can kind of learn from you? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it, it's on my website for free, right? Like if you want a, a single family home analyzer, simplepassivecashflow.com slash analyzer, for example, right? Like I, like my parents, they kind of followed the whole dogma, they, they, work and live here in Hawaii. My mom was a teacher and my dad works for the state. Like they are unfortunately a victim of, you know, the economic system where they're, we're all told to invest in Wall Street mutual funds and work to their 60 or 70. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I've kind of uncovered, you know, through my travels on the mainland, living on the mainland, now living back at home now that there's definitely different ways of doing things that are much more tax advantage and risk advantage, uh, you know, certainly risk adjusted returns are better. That, um, you know, I just wanted to put it out there on the internet for free. And if people are kind of interested, check it out, right? Um, totally interested in doing, you know, investor calls with people. All I ask is just go listen to the first dozen podcasts. I mean, my first dozen podcasts are all about uh, turnkey rentals, buying remotely on the mainland um later later on you know as the pod podcast progress I mean, this is way back in 2016 when i started it you know it gets into syndications and stuff like that but you know check out the first podcast and i'm totally willing to kind of put in the time and you know have a chat like this you know over the phone so yeah so is there any other advice, especially with the way the stock market is going, the way we, we kind of don't know where the economy's headed? Do you have any other advice for people who might want to get started? Yeah, I mean, personally, I got out of the 401k, all the paper assets, maybe three or four years ago. Um, but I definitely felt like I, it was a very stressful taking out because everything we're taught is the opposite, right? Um, but I also created an accredited investor group here locally in Hawaii where we can talk about these type of things and feelings, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. And it's not, it's not crazy, right? To invest in hard assets that cash flow and not be in the stock market. But, you know, again, it comes down to your network. Oh yeah. Yeah. So the stock market was pretty volatile there for a little while. So, but all right, anything you'd like to add? This has been great because I, I love when I can learn stuff and I had already explained to you I wasn't really clear on the A, B, and C class. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I, you know, I think, I think something that really helped me when I got started, like I started to realize what was, what did I have in terms of time, money, and knowledge, right? Like I was an engineer. I, you know, I made a pretty decent salary, you know, nothing too crazy. But um, I didn't have too much time. So that was where a lot of like what my, my skill set or what my, my avatar was kind of lined up for was to be a passive investor. And at the time when I started just out of college, I had no money. So I had to kind of just start buying single family home rentals. And, you know, this is not a get rich quick thing, but it's a get rich surely thing. So, all right. So um, we will have uh, Lane's contact information um, on, on the link on YouTube. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to him. You can reach out to me. I, I can get you together. Um, thank you all for joining us. Again, it's uh, life is life of the land is in its real estate. Next, in two weeks, we're back again, and I have the Becks, who are Keller Williams agents from the Big Island, to share about what the market and the shift has done on the other islands. So I can, I can tell you what it's like here in Oahu, but are they seeing something different um, on the out 
outer islands there in Maui and on the big island. So they'll be with us to share with us. And I would love some interesting topics. If there's anything you guys would like to know about, we have some more upcoming guests that are, that are quite interesting, but I'd love your input and what you'd like to see. So thank you. And I will see you guys in a couple weeks. Thank you.